that shouldn't give away the whole secret to professional winter. Matei Yakino giving up one elbow along for his body. Here we go. What a finish. The guy is kind of talking bullshit. The team has just got to work a little harder. Welcome to the Windsurfing Podcast, back again for episode 33, and this one is an absolute banger. We're going back in time uh, to a time when windsurfing was invented, and you are going to hear the full backstory. We're going to hear about the guy who invented windsurfing with... Uh, Jim Drake, yes. They then got sued by Peter Chilvers. They were making millions off the patent. We hear about the marketing and the brains behind the whole windsurfing in the first place. Um, it is so, so interesting, this podcast. And we have got a double team for you. We have got the Schweitzer family. Yes, Matt, the first ever windsurfing world champion. And now his son, all-round waterman, Zane Schweitzer. Honestly, this is absolutely amazing. Check it out. Zane, how you doing, man? Yeah, I'm not check. All good, brother. Great to see you. Looking forward to chat with you. Yeah, um, it's been a couple of scary days there in Maui, huh? I mean, so much rain, floods, and it looked... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah you know, rain isn't... Um, on the west side of Maui is usually a blessing, but on the North shore, we've had some really serious rains that took away people's homes and yeah, some heavy devastation for sure. A big flash flood. Yeah. Not to get into a, to a, you know, heavy mood. Let me just remind you how we met. <laughs> you remember? Yes. I look forward to hearing your, your <laughs> side of that. <laughs> so there was a contest in Peru. I think a formula, con like a junior formula contest or whatever. I'm a couple of years older than you. I think two or three. Or Ifka, Ifka, Ifka Junior, yeah, and Conbe. Like a very, very long name, yeah, <laughs> of a contest. And my <laughs> my first, um, like my first memory of that trip that comes to mind is you lighting a firework out of Connor Baxter's ass. <laughs> 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 yeah, that was uh that was some good times, bro. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> I mean the Polish the Polish crew was um was uh was good, was going strong with the fun, but uh I think you guys outdid us that time. <laughs> the first thing I think of that trip was Pisco Sours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's oh good. Yeah. yeah, we had a blast though. Like it's uh it's good, good to remember. So carefree, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. amazing, amazing. Running around Peru, you know, not realizing that it's probably dangerous. Like just oh, running, yeah. running around board shorts and middle of the night, pisco sour, yeah, all that. Oh, I'll never forget some of those times we had, man. I mean, we were we were young kids too, so you know, it was kind of like um, the beginning of our of our um, journey is as waterman rock stars in a way <laughs> we we got into a lot of trouble bro that was good fun you yeah. know and at the end of the day too we, we we made the most out of our days right we would be out surfing and windsurfing all morning and then partying all night <laughs> yeah it was, oh, good, uh, yeah it was it was definitely it was definitely fun times and you know like when i look back it was kind of like you guys like your generation let's say like yourself, Connor, Kai, you were all into windsurfing at that point. And then yep. SUP came and you kind of dove right into that. Was that like conscious yep. from your side or was it parents? Was it economical? Was it industry? Was it, what was it? I think it? it was a little bit of everything, you know, like we, we saw the sport on the rise with people that we saw as our mentors and coaches, you know, guys like Dave Kalama and, Robbie Nash and Laird Hamilton were, were using it as a form of cross training when the wind wasn't up and when, when the waves were not up. And so it was something that was kind of already on our radar, but I think what really had Connor Kai and I really diving into it was starboard and Nash catching on to it early on being some of the first production board stand up paddle boards to hit the market. And so we were encouraged to go to our windsurf events and bring our stand-up paddle boards. 
and play around on them before the competition started, before the wind came up. And so we were going to events in Japan and Korea and, and Peru, of course, as we talked to. And, um, you know, before the wind came up in between heats and, you know, just playing around on the sup and the waves. And, you know, it became this sport that was really hand in hand with, uh, with windsurfing, you know, cause a lot of locations around the world, the wind's not up and peaking all day. You know, you, at least in Maui, you know, you got some nice glassy conditions, uh, until about 10, 11 AM. And then it's time to rig up the windsurf gear. And, um, so it fit really well, but I think what really kept us going at it was all the opportunity. I mean, it, it was the fastest growing sport in the world at one point, And it was, uh, it was exciting. I mean, things were changing fast. We were in everything that we were doing was looked at with a fine uh, tooth and, and, and all those maneuvers were being implemented in the designs and the shapes and, you know, things were changing quick. It was, it was kind of fun to be somewhat of a pioneer of, of that sport. And in, in many ways I got to, you know, feel like I was following in my parents' footsteps because, you know, my dad, uh, when he was my age, he was sharing the world, windsurfing with the world. And, you know, now here I am as a young teenager traveling on the world tour for windsurf, sharing stand up paddling with the world. And, uh, so, I definitely have a lot of fun with it, you know, and there's no doubt about that. But I think what really kept me going so hard at it the last few years was like, man, it, how could I not? I mean, I was able to create a lifestyle around the ocean and, uh, and, and, you know, be able to, you know, just follow my passions on the water. And, you know, just because uh, a lot of my competitions were in stand up paddle for the last, I'd say the last five years, eight years, you know, it's been mostly stand up battle events for me. Um, and, uh, you know, but of course in between always training uh, on the windsurf and surfboard and, you know, having as much fun as I can with other things. But, uh, you know, now we see kind of this, this recurring cycle with hydrofoiling and with wing riding, you know, now wing foiling and, and hydrofoil surfing is that next big thing that's on the rise. And, and so I've been spending most of my time doing that lately. And so <laughs> I don't want to call myself an opportunist here, but, <laughs> but, but I'm but definitely clear, riding, yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely riding the, the train, you know, and, and enjoying every moment of it because it's exciting times, you know, like we're doing maneuvers that no one's ever done yet. And we're able to, to call, you know, really push the boundaries of what's possible. And so I think that's why I'm attracted to these new things. You know, it's like, being able to create our own path and, and kind of create the vibe for this new sport. Yeah. And being Maui definitely helps, you know, where a lot of that progression is made. You know, we saw like some backflips coming out really early and we saw mm -hmm. yeah a lot of the wing stuff and whatever. And I think being there, it's, it's kind of hard to resist that, right? I mean, there's this new thing you're going to try and all of a mm -hmm. sudden you're one of the best in the world. So why not? Right. And, yeah, maybe the only, I don't know, the only con against it is that those other things you're doing, the sports grew to such a high level, like windsurfing and, and stand up paddle that, you know, probably doing other things kind of takes away from those sports, right? I mean, windsurfing at some point, what, did you have like a moment, like you said, okay, competitive windsurfing kind of bye bye you know because yeah for especially for racing because you know early on my competitive career started more so with formula and, and slalom and and all these race events I'm, I'm a surfer at heart you know and so as soon as i have an opportunity to get in the waves i was like yep we go <laughs> let's go let's ride the waves and and so there wasn't too many wave riding events that um you know, I was doing throughout the year for windsurf. A lot of the events I was kind of encouraged to do from starboard were formula and slalom. You know, at that time we were just kickstarting the pro kids series with starboard. And so there was a lot of push for Connor and I and the young team at starboard to, you know, follow these, these events and get their, their product out there. And that was a big part of it. You know, there's no doubt, like, you know, it was showing up, hosting a clinic, doing a board demo, you know, and 
making the most out of the trip pretty much, you know, and, and, and my coaches, my entire life have been telling me, you know, things like you just said, you know, where you're like, are you really gonna, you know, juggle so many things and be, you know, and you could be the world champion shortboard surfers. And, you know, I heard that from all kinds of coaches growing up and at the end of the day, yes, I love to be um, a master at something, but at, I'd rather feel that I could enjoy every single day on the water for the rest of my life. And knowing that I'm proficient, if not expert at almost every category that I, any day on the water, I can look out there and be like, hell yeah, it's a great day to go foil. It's a great day to go downwind paddle. It's a great day to go canoe. Let's go kite surf. Let's go windsurf, whatever. And there's a time and a place for it for me, for sure. You know, what determines the amount of effort and training that I put into it and time is, you know, my, my schedule. If I have a race event coming up, then hell yeah, I'm going to put three months, put the hammer down, focus most of my time into cardio and racing and getting my, picking up my abilities, you know, um, through COVID that presented the opportunity for me to focus on windsurf because all of my stand up paddle surf waterman events were canceled and I was home. And so I was like, Hey, I'm normally always kind of itching to go windsurf with how busy my schedule is. And so through COVID, I've been having so much fun just windsurfing all over Maui and uh, kind of re-sparking my, my passion for that. And um, yeah, so I think there's a time and a place for everything. But, you know, at the end of the day, you have to log a certain amount of hours to, to master something. And, you know, fortunately for me, I, I've... I kind of shape my daily routine and lifestyle around logging hours on the water, you know, whether it's personal training, professional competitions or demo days or coaching, you know, doing private and group coaching, you know, and so the waves could be 50 foot tomorrow. And, you know, today I could still be having fun on my longboard, riding nose, teaching, you know, one of my students. And tomorrow goes straight out into Jaws, you know, whatever. And so I think um, that allows me to definitely, um, you know, sharpen my skills in, in, in many areas because we have a lot of diverse conditions here. And and um, and for me, I kind of like to be able to log every week a little bit of time in each sport. And so I think lately my focus has been hydrofoil surfing and wing riding. Uh, along with big wave surfing. So that's like kind of my three main focus throughout this, this winter. Um, big wave surfing, of course, for a bit there was all I was doing because we had so much waves. I mean, of course, I'm not going to go out hydrofoiling when we got 50 foot seas, you know, unless it was tow foiling and big surf. Um, yeah. So let's, yeah. let's, let's, let's ask the impossible question. So you have, eight foot barrels in Honolulu Bay. You have like 20 knots, 25 knots side shore, side off in Hokipa for windsurfing. You have perfect winging wherever you go winging, whatever. What's your, what's your to-do list? Barreled. Go get barreled. Yeah. <laughs> That's priority number one. I think big waves, and barrels are my priority number one when it comes to conditions because for Maui, it's the most rare. We got wind every freaking day. We got windsurfing conditions every day, pretty much. Foiling almost every day. Barrels and big wave riding, that's an occasion. That's a special treat. You got to jump on it. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so, you, so it's like for, for the rest of us, it's like wave sailing head high. You get, you get barreled like that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so rare. And you know, a lot of the time, my hardest, uh, the, the, my issue I struggle with the most, which I think sometimes can be a burden on like just my mental clarity is what the fuck to pack. Like I'm, I'm sitting there at five in the morning, look, scratching my head, trying to read the forecast and look at the conditions around me. And I'm, I'm packing my truck, trying to make the decision. Am I going to drive 45 minutes North? to the North shore to ride Ho'okipa or Jaws? Am I going to go 30 minutes up upper West side to get barreled at Honolulu? Am I going to go, you know, paddle on the race board in Lahaina or Kihei in, in the flat water? And so oftentimes I leave my house 
you know, with my windsurf gear, my hydrofoil wing and surf gear, and I'll pack it away to the point where if I get to my location and it's not as good for what I was originally planning to do, then I could still go out and have fun on, on something else. But this is what I don't get in Maui. Like all you guys drive pickup trucks. In Europe, we all have like massive vans, like seven meter long vans, you know, that you just have everything packed and ready, you know, <laughs> you guys. I love get- that. I think it's so cool. I think that's so cool. I, in my early days, windsurfing, I adored all the pros that had their badass custom paint jobs on the side of their car, their, their name and their sponsors. I was like, that is so freaking cool. Are you kidding me? It gets a little cheesy though, <laughs> right? Right now I would, I think like I, I just got a new van and I'm struggling to put my fucking massive face on the side of it. You know, I'm like a little bit, ah, it's a little bit, yeah. you know, for Maui style, I would never do that. For you sure. know, if I, lived, if I lived on the mainland or in Europe, then yeah. But in Maui, it's just too small of a community. I don't need a sticker on my truck for everyone to know that's my truck driving by, you know? And so I try and keep low key, I think for the most part and blend in. I think blending in is important yeah. because you don't want to stick out like a sore thumb. Next thing you know, you come in, you have no fucking tires on your car. And you- <laughs> yeah, already, already when you have like windsurfing, winging gear and kiting gear or whatever, and you go to Honolulu, that's kind of probable, right? Or whatever, yeah. one of the secret spots. Yeah. Are, so it depends where you go and who you are, you know? And yeah. I think uh, for me, I grew up on West Maui. It's primarily a surf culture on the West side. And so shortboard surfing and longboard surfing is, and then canoe paddle is the main thing on West Maui. And so um, growing up, you know, I was one of the very few riders that would roll up to Honolulu Bay or like the more localized surf spots and have my stand up paddle board, my windsurf gear all loaded up to the tee and, let, and there's signs everywhere saying no sup, no stand up paddling, you know, <laughs> but every, everyone knows, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, my, what I do, you know, and I'm, I try and definitely give back whenever I can to our community. I, I understand I'm super fortunate. Like most, most of my friends in our community outside of my professional athlete friends, Oh man, it's a hustle. You, you're working, you're working all day serving to the tourism community, whether you're teaching activities, serving at restaurants or hotels, whatever. And so, you know, growing up, I'm really grateful that I get to, you know, be a professional athlete and, and get to spend the more hours on the water, the better, you know? And, and so growing, I've always kind of made a point to, um, do host events in our community to teach kids how to windsurf, teach kids how to stand up paddle and, um, get them out there surfing. We do scholarship donations each year with, uh, with my family and I, and, you know, try and make sure kids in our community have a similar opportunity that I have. And, um, I think that goes a long way because you have a place like Hawaii where, where are you right now in Poland? I'm in Tenerife, Canary Islands. You're in Tenerife. So no matter where you are in the world, I could say, if you're a windsurfer or a surfer, you think, I'm going to go to Hawaii one day. <laughs> I'm going to go to Hokipa. <laughs> you know? And so that's everyone. You know, Everyone wants to show and everyone's going to eventually show up to Maui or, or the North Shore of Oahu. And so um, a, a word of advice to, to people planning, you know, you're not the only one and to tread lightly. You know, and to go about the the community, you know, with as much aloha as possible, and uh, you know, when you can, share story with uh, with the locals, and and yeah, and give back when you can. And I think that's also something we did um, out in Peru, when when we, I met you, you know, for that junior event out in Ancon. I'll never forget that kids event because you know, out in Ancon and other places in Peru. Ooh, the poverty community is way gnarlier than what we have here in Hawaii. And so, um, you know, to see some of those kids who barely even swim, get out on the windsurfer and paddleboard, you know, and just see, realize, oh shit, this is a playground I have in front of me. And they never even knew it, <laughs> you know? So that's like a, a really power, powerful thing that we all have, right? We have this escape with the wind and with the ocean, whether we're riding a foil, a windsurf board or a surfboard. Um, I think it's a big goal of mine throughout whatever I'm doing to be able to share that with, with other people to see this, this ocean and our beaches 
as, as something that not only we could leave with more joy and less stress, but you know, something that we want to take care of. And I think at the end of the day, we all, we all feel that, that sense of a uh, sense of camaraderie between each other in our community, but also this sense of pride for our, our local spots or our ocean. And yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, back to windsurfing a little bit, like, your granddad pretty much invented the sport and your dad was the first, first world champion. Does that like, does it, does it get more pressure than this for, for a kid growing up into the sport? Like, <laughs> how was that? You know, I think I've gro always grown up appreciating that pressure. Um, my brother took it a different way. My brother's five years older than me. He's the firstborn. And so he might have caught a different vibe than me, but we're definitely different people. And I, I saw growing up, my brother avoid every chance to windsurf. You know, and he always just stuck to his shortboard with all of his friends. And at that time, all of his friends were like the coolest kids to me. Like they were like my heroes. I was a young eight-year-old kid chasing around these teenagers that were all Hawaii's best surfers, you know, guys like Clay Marzo and Stranger Larson and Ian Walsh and Matt Miola. Those are my, all my brother's buddies. And, but Maddie avoided windsurfing at all costs, you know, and, and I kind of saw that growing up and I kind of always wondered why. Um, and I think it's, you know, I think he felt that pressure a little more than me, but at the same time, um, I had a different group of friends that really allowed me to want to windsurf more. And, you know, I want to give huge credit to Kansas Stott and the Stott family who influenced the whole, my whole generation of windsurfers. You know, even, even, even the older kids, guys like Nick Warmoth and um, Connor Baxter, Jake Gome, Kai Lenny, Kalani Hunt, Baker Grant, um, Nikki Vetramayo. We had such a solid junior team, you know, at these summer kids camps. And uh, the Stott family made it so fun. They made it the cool thing, you know? And um, I think that's what really made windsurfing such a huge part of my life was my band, my parents didn't pressure me into it. They didn't ever like want to drag me to the beach. Um, and I think it's because maybe they knew the possibility of pressure that they experienced with my brother. And so instead, I think my parents would drop me off just with other kids and with, um, and I had so much fun just playing with the other kids at Kanaha beach, you know, at these summer kids programs, we would just mess around, you know? And, and then next thing you know, we're competing in the slalom summer series. And then next thing you know, we're like 10 year old kids at the Aloha classic and it's double mass high. And the judges are like, I don't know, maybe we should cancel the kids division. And all of our parents are crazy. Like, no, they're ready for this. Shut them out. <laughs> so, we had a really unique, uh, unique upbringing, I think uh, on Maui. And I, I want a huge credit to the Stott family, but as well to my friends like Kai, Connor, Baker, uh, Kalani, Jake, you know, we, we all pushed each other a lot, you know, and um, I think that's what got us to be at such a high level at a young age because, um, do I still have you there? Much yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. My, I had a call coming on the other line, just declining. No worries. But yeah, um, it was real special. We all got to push each other. Um, we all were influenced by older riders, older professionals, you know, and uh I think that was a, a kind of just stuck with it. I mean, from there, it was like we were always hanging out with the older guys like uh, Nick Warmoth and Jimmy Diaz and, you know, Kevin Pritchard. And, you know, my favorite riders, you know, growing up was Mark Angulo and, and Levi Cyber. And, you know, and so yeah, it was kind right of there, right? I mean, you're you're from the, you know you got the name. So you're, you're, you're there right in the, right in that mix. Right. Um, what's the, what's the like most told, uh, granddad's inventing windsurfing story you've had around family dinners or, Oh my God, whatever. You it's know? so hard to get stories out of them sometimes. Um, 
especially nowadays. Are you still there? Um, yeah. Sorry, I went blank for a second. Nowadays, my my grandfather is um, unfortunately losing, uh, experiencing pretty heavy Alzheimer's, and so it's hard to get much stories out of him lately. But my grandmother is so sharp, um, and she, if not just as much, maybe more, deserves credit to the what windsurfing is today, because my grandfather was very intelligent, very passionate. He was a surfer. He was a sailor, you know, and he patented the, the universal joint, which was pretty much made windsurfing a functioning sport. Right. And my grandmother, she started the first magazine. She organized the first regatta. She made the first newsletters. She made every windsurfer feel a part of this family, a part of this community. And she made it so, she made it a family and a community sport. And whenever I hear stories from older windsurfers from the original windsurf days, you know, and, or my grandparents, it's always this, you know, it's, it's like 50, it's like 50% regatta, a hundred and percent party. You know, it was like always about just a good time. Like, yes, you're out there for the regatta. And everyone shows up with a backpack. Like, just imagine that. My grandparents would send shipping containers around the world. You'd roll up to the event, sign your name, and you grab the, your gear at the event. You didn't have to travel with anything. Everyone's on the same stuff. Dream. And so it became so fun and easy to just show up and do it. And, and the, the, the skill level was, you know, a little bit more tight because everyone was on the same gear. And so it was a lot more fun, I think, right? When I hear stories of competitive windsurfing back in the day, it was like, it just sounded, it, so, it sounded like a, a blast, you know? And, and, and some of my favorite stories, though, to answer your question more directly, was, um, you know, hearing stories of my grandmother out on the start boat. And she's a hardcore badass chick like she's like an original water woman you know what i mean like she'd be out there rain hail freaking 50 knot winds whatever always out there on the start boat with her megaphone and her horn and she'd tell stories of like just getting hammered and thrashed you know with uh, gnarly conditions but she would always laugh at my mike waltz gary eversall my dad And because they'd be just fucking around before the start. And that's what created windsurf freestyle. That's how windsurf freestyle started. You know, hearing stories from, you know, my, my grandmother watching, you know, hundreds, I'm not talking about like a few dozen, no, hundreds of people behind a start line waiting for that start. And then the top crowd of people who are winning all the races are literally fucking around doing rail rides, back winding the sail, doing three six right close to the start, up until that start horn, and then oh, it's on moments before. But you know that's how Winter Freestyle started. It was like you know to bury the anxiety and just have fun up until that horn's called. And it, I'm sure it was also too a way for those younger riders. You know, at that time, my dad and Gary and 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 all those guys were young. You know, they were teenagers. And so they're probably trying to just get creative and themselves, you know, and um, those are some of my favorite stories. But I mean, there's so many, a lot of of one, another one, Mike Waltz and my dad train hopping in Japan after, you know, winning a big event. And they're literally just partying all night with the Japanese guys. And they, they sneak up off this moving train and they're on the roof of the train as it's moving and they're all running jumping from tram to tram on the roof of the train. And like, I just, I don't know. I just, I think back and, you know, they're all pioneers, you know, and they're all just like, I think, I think I know where you get your ideas from now. (laughs) Yeah, no, I I hear stories of just like the shit my parents did. And like, it was wild, wild West, you know, there was no cell phones and social media. It was like, just you go out, you have fun, you make some laughs. That's what lasts. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. It sounds good. On a more serious note, like any, any stories about like 
the, the conflict with Jim Drake and buying him yeah. out, buying him out for, I, I, I read up on it like 36 grand, which at that time was probably a, about what 300 grand is today. So a whole lot of money, which became at that point, maybe wasn't, you know, wasn't that obvious, but well, then it became like a worldwide business, as you say, um, thanks mm -hmm. to your, thanks to your granny. It, it was a very sour thing on my family's legacy, you know, and, and this is a huge part of the film we're bringing about right now, Broken Molds. It's telling the story, the good, the bad, the ugly, the turmoil that, you know, my family went through literally bringing up this sport, bringing it to the world and having it taken away from them, you know? And so I, a lot of the time I'm, I'm almost sad when my grandparents are hassled for interviews all the times they're hassled for shit all the time. Ever since the lawsuits, they don't want anything to do with it. Yeah. And you know, you know how much they spent their life. Like they, um, you know, I hear stories of my grandparent, my grandma and grandpa, they had three kids. And, you know, at that time when they were young and they were just starting windsurfing, they sold everything. They were poor. You know, they were, they were having the kids stay at home to work on windsurfers instead of going to school. You know, it was a family thing that they put their blood, sweat and tears into. And once it finally became successful and all of a sudden they finally started to you know, create something out of it. You know, there was um, other parties that were not happy to see it successful. And so what happened early on, Jim Drake and my grandfather, you know, um, they came up with this, this plan together. And Jim was actually an investor. Jim was, he, he actually put down some money to, to help get it going. And after X amount of time, at one point, Jim said, this isn't going to work. I don't want anything to do with it. They signed an agreement, signed it over, and he was done with it. He didn't believe in it. And my grandparents continued on, you know, pushing forward. They believed in it. And they, they, want, they milked that original funding they had until they went into their own personal funds, you know. And, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it was something where I kind of feel that when my grandmother and grandfather look back on anything re related to that, it's like, it's almost like their, their child abandoned them, you know, like they put so much into the, a huge chunk of their life into this sport. And, you know, not, and, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't for the money, you know, like the more I talk, I look at my grandparents and like why they were involved. It was like, dude, they loved the community. They loved the sport. They loved the regatta life, you know, and there is no doubt that, yeah, for a little bit there, they were doing really well, you know, fuck. It was, I hear stories from older windsurfers, you know, you're driving down the Autobahn and every third car has a windsurfer on it. You know, you can't imagine what that's like nowadays, you know? And so they were doing something right because ever since, they lost control of the sport. It's, uh, you know, it kind of has had a somewhat of a downward spiral. And so, and I'm not saying for growth, for performance, fuck, there's, I, I show videos to my grandma and grandpa of some of the stuff my favorite freestylers are doing in, in Bonaire and in Grand Canaria. And they're like, they have no idea what they're watching. They're like, and before my grandfather had bad Alzheimer's, I had a uh, Tati Franz and, and Kiri Toad and, all these guys staying at our house and my, we're all showing them a little, a video at a family barbecue. And I remember my grandfather looking and, and he said something like, I never would have imagined it would come to this. And the way he said it was like, so dead serious, but just completely baffled with the, how far it's come and what people are doing with it. You know, and yeah, pretty much like the biggest compliment you can ever hear, right? You're doing like something on a, you know, on a windsurfer and then the inventor of windsurfing tells you like, wow, you know, that's pretty yeah. insane. <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's crazy, you know? And so they, they spent their lives seeing windsurfing as this family sport, 
you know, maybe a need for speed and some nice regatta, regatta course racing, you know, and, um, my dad and Mike Waltz and, you know, Dave Kalama and a lot of those early sur- core surfers that were into windsurfing, once they transitioned away from regatta, it was a hundred percent. How could we take this thing to the air? How could we bring this thing in the waves? You know, I hear stories of my dad and, and Mike Waltz and Robbie Nash as young kids, just hacking away their fins and their dagger boards, you know, and, Oh, actually, no, what happened was the first time they decided to, to get rid of the dagger board that, you know, they're riding this giant original windsurfer. And of course my dad and the younger guys like Mike were playing in the waves with them. You know, can we, can we surf this thing? Well, yeah, we can. Sure enough, lost control, had a hard time kicking no out foot on straps. the wave. You know, no <laughs> foot straps. The, the board's kind of ro- a counter rolling because the, the, fo- uh, the big dagger board in the middle as it's on the wave and hits a rock. And the rock breaks the dagger board more than in half. And then my dad's like, shit, this thing surfs better than ever. <laughs> and so then they started cutting dagger boards and cutting fins and realizing, shit, we could do sliding jibes. You know, we could do these tight turns. We could ride the wave a little better. And then they start putting, you know, um, they, on a hot day at the beach, they notice their board melted and the rocker line changed. Their rocker line started to, to bend. And like, what the frick? They were in Mexico. Sorry, my um, my mom called me on the other line there. I don't know if we lost service, but, um, it's okay, but they were it's in okay. Baja. They would go to Baja a lot. And, and, you know, another funny side note to this, as it was one of my favorite family locations for my grandparents and my dad and uncle and auntie to go as a family to test windsurf gear and to ride. For a while there, the original name for windsurfer was Windscape. Windscape, W-I-N-D-S-K-8. And then it turned into the Baja board because they were going to Baja all the time. And then it was windsurfer, you know? And so that's what stuck was windsurfer. But anyway, hot day in Baja out in Mexico, my dad noticed the board started to melt and change rocker line. And so then they started getting plastic bags, black bags. They would put it over the front of the board so it gets really hot. And then they would add nose rocker so that they could do more wave riding stuff. And then, you know, and you hear stories of within, within a week, they're going from an 11, 12 foot board down to 11, 10, 10, nine. And then all of a sudden they got straps and then shit's just progressing. It's just like this, this growing beast that you just can't stop. And like, everyone's just doing new shit, cutting down boards, making it more performance. Next thing you know, you know, guys are throwing backflips and front flips at Ho'okipa. And it's just like, it, it, it Insane, makes yeah. me so excited to think about because in many ways I get, I'm experiencing that with before stamp paddle and now at foil where every day you go to the beach, it doesn't matter what the conditions are. It's an exciting new day and you're testing new shit. You're making these small adjustments and it might be shit. It might be better. We don't know. We were throwing things that no one's done before. It might be possible. It might not. You know, like when I first started doing backflips on the wing foil, I don't think, I don't think there was my first day on the wing foil. Actually, I was uh, borrowing gear from Alan Cadiz and or, and or Pete Cabrina. I forget. We we're at Kanaha. And I remember going for five minutes back and forth. And I like, well, this is, I'm ready to do something else. Let's fucking flip this thing. <laughs> My first day wing foiling, I remember approaching this wave and thinking, well, this feels like windsurfing. And I went for a push loop. And, and that's when I was like, okay, there's something more to this. Because that first five minutes, I was starting to get the feel like, oh, is this all you could do? Go back and forth and cruise. And it was like, no, there's, we're going to be seeing some crazy stuff happen with this. And sure enough, a few months later, now we got, you know, all kind of uh, double var- variable maneuvers, double flip maneuvers, you know, and w- professional windsurf freestylers coming into the sport doing shit that's like, okay, well, this is stepping it up a whole nother notch, you know? And so 
it's exciting progression, you know, and innovation and to be a part of it and to be in the middle of it, you yeah. know? Yeah. So it must have been even like, you know, for your dad without Instagram and without, you know, without all those things, it must have been even cooler, right? So you can't imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So your dad's right in there and like first world champion. And, but nowadays when you, I don't know, when you think of the old times and whatever, everybody's like, Robbie, 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 like, is your dad like, I don't know, underrated, you reckon? Out on, out in no. the, you know, I because think I, think I think in Europe, just, uh... I, I think in Europe is a little bit different, the, the knowledge, you know, than Hawaii. Thinking well, Hawaii. This, this is the difference. I think Robbie Nash and his team wanted him to be a superstar. My dad never wanted to be a superstar. He, it wasn't his desire. As soon as, as soon as he left the game, we could say, with competitive windsurfing, he didn't want shit to do with cameras and, and, and stuff like that. You know, my dad's one of those guys where you watch interviews of him back in the day, and it's almost like he's always trying to run away from the interview. He's a full introvert. Like, he doesn't want to, you know, it's, and so in many ways, he was just out there to have fun and to push the limits, to do his thing. And, you know, he made a choice when he moved to Maui. He moved to West Maui. He didn't move to the North Shore where all the other pro windsurfers were, where the mecca of windsurfing was. He went to West Maui and stayed quiet, riding secret spots to himself for decades. And no one even knew about these spots. And he's out there riding by himself as Ho'okipa is becoming a European zoo, you know? And so... There's, there's no doubt that I look at my dad as just this soul rider. You know, he's out there wind fishing. He's still today. Like he, when he goes out windsurfing, I'd say for the most part, he's doing it to catch a fish. He, you know, he puts a pole holder on the back of his windsurfer. He'll go out riding and he'll come in with freaking fish for the family. You know, like he, 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 and to this week, every week he's out in the mountains dirt biking. And like, that's his thing. Like, he will run away from everything and everyone. As soon as life gets a little crazy, I hear the dirt bike start up and he's gone by himself up in the mountains. You know what I mean? And so he's all about that kind of um, lifestyle. And, um, you know, when I hear stories of, of uh, my dad from, a rid from old school riders, all you hear is genuine stories. All you hear is amazing times and moments that people will never forget, you know, whether it was on the water or party because he wasn't trying to be anything else. You know, he, he wasn't trying to, I, I think in many ways he was actually trying to not be in the scene of it. I think he felt pressure as well. You know, you got to imagine my, my dad, my uncle and my auntie as young teenagers and my grandparents would be like, okay, Matt, you're going to go to Europe uh, to Lake Garda and Meeting you there is this Jean Pierno. And even though you're 14 years old, you're going to stay with Jean Pierno for the next two months. He's going to show you where the windsurf container is. And you're going to teach windsurfing on Lake Garda for, for the next two months. And that's his life. That was, and then my auntie at the same time would be in Germany as my uncle is in the United States. And it was a family thing. But at the same time, I think my dad felt pressure with like, you know, he maybe would rather be out riding his bicycle with his friends as a young teenage kid or may or, you know, but he was out there, you know, with the responsibility to wear the windsurfer hat and and best believe he had pressure to win that damn event. And I think he was happy when there was someone else to go and win the events. You know, when <laughs> Robbie came about and was like kind of jumping in the scene, I think my dad was actually happy. Because then it was like, thank Pressure God, these guys yeah. don't have to worry about me. You know, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you reckon? So you reckon these days he's like getting planing behind a big tuna or a mai mai or something? <laughs> oh, his... Right now, I know what he's doing right now. I, I I've tra been trying to get him on this podcast with you, and every time he's like, ah, oh, no, I don't no. think so. No, probably not. No, probably not. He called me. He knows I'm doing this podcast at nine. He called me like. 15 minutes before the podcast. Hey, Zane, you want to go, uh, you want to go for a, a sup fish with me? 
go fishing off the stand-up paddleboard. And I'm like, Dad, I got this podcast coming up. So, okay, okay, okay. Well, all right. Well, like, maybe come stop by and say hi to everyone. Oh, yeah, maybe, maybe. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, after what you said, I think he's not coming. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But who knows? Who knows? He might just roll up. <laughs> that would be dope. That would be dope, yeah. Um, so... If anybody watches your Instagram, sees you like winging and supping on starboards and stuff. But for this year, for your windsurf boards, you have these custom boards with the original windsurfer logo. Um, is the brand coming back or what? Or is that just, uh, just back, a throw? Now, bringing it back to life, you know, not, not in the sense of a business, but I mean, just in the sense to keep the legacy alive, you know. Um, I've recently been let go from the starboard team for windsurfing. Um, I'm still riding starboard for stand up paddle and for hydrofoil and wing, but, um, now I'm a free agent for windsurf. And so I, I took the liberty to, um, work with some local Maui shapers, including Keith Taboo and Sean Ordnez and, and make some custom, uh, spray jobs, giving, um, you know, a little bit of homage to the windsurfer and as well to some of those classic uh, you know, color schemes you would see on those boards from the eighties. And so I took uh, inspiration from, of course, the original windsurfer, but as well from the rocket and a, a uh, another European, uh, board brand called Flyboard. And, um, and so that's how I kind of, you know, going through old magazines and stuff. I was like, you know what? These boards are sick. <laughs> like I love those old school designs. And so now I'm like, you know, I made one with the local artist named Nano. And I'm, I think I'm just going to make all my boards looking like that now because I love in the feel. And it's cool because I have friends of, uh, you know, our family hitting me up. Yeah, it's so ha it makes me so happy to see the Iraq and the windsurf logo. Uh, you know, and they tell me a story of, of their time with my grandparents or their time with my parents. And, and to me, it's, it's what makes the world feel so small and so connected. It's like, yes, I've traveled the world. I'm, I'm 27 years old, but I've been traveling since I was 12. A lot of those events with you even, you know, and on those travels, no matter where I am, I run into one of my parents' friends or one of my grandparents' friends, you know, and it's what I appreciate the most is to feel this con family connection between our sports, you know, and between the friendships made in our community and to feel truly welcomed to those areas. Like, You know, when, when I go to a fam unfamiliar place and I meet someone tells me a story about, you know, riding with my dad or my mom back in the day, it makes me stoked. It makes me feel part of that For area. Sure. I feel like I'm meant to be there. And I'm like, oh man, it's just exciting, you know? <laughs> For sure. And so I, I, I'm feeling a lot of pride to carry it on, you know, with my, with my gear here and getting a lot more people sharing stories since. <laughs> yeah. So what's the, what's the like legal situation you guys obviously the the windsurfer you know trademark is still still in the family right or how, how does it work actually you it's um it's a little bit of a gray area so i believe my grandparents signed off the trademark and went and windsurfer to um wiley bill wiley in australia Fuck, is that his name? Bruce I'm Wiley. Bruce, so Wiley. Bruce, Bruce Wiley. Bruce Wiley. Uncle Bruce. Bruce Uncle Wiley, Bruce Wiley. the owner uh, or the, the, the CEO of Cobra, the factory, or the owner exactly. or something. So, yeah. Exactly. So Uncle Bruce, he's a big family friend of ours, worked with my grandparents back in the day. I believe he was one of the first people to bring Windsurfer to Australia. And he's been loyal to my grandparents ever since. And so when everything was happening with, you know, my bill or excuse me, Bruce wanted to see the windsurfer continue. And so he's been holding on to the trademark since then. He's been reviving the original windsurfer class with something called the windsurfer LT, which stands yeah. for lighter and tougher. And actually they've been bringing about regatta style events again in uh, places like Largo de Garda, Italy, um, in Australia and they have a full on series of like this original class of regatta style racing on, on these original style gear where everyone's on the same stuff. And so, 
yeah, we've been uh, bringing about, of course, she gave me permission. Long story short to your question. Yes, I'm allowed to rock my grandparents' logo. <laughs> and he's super stoked to see it because it's, uh, it's good advertising for what he's got going with the original LT as well. So, um, you know, um, we have a few of those orig- uh, windsurfer LTs here on Maui and they're so much fun, dude. We go out on days where it's like light wind, family day and we'll teach friends that have never windsurfed and everyone's having fun on the same year you know <laughs> yeah um the broken molds movie you mentioned yeah give me, the, give me the lowdown give me your give me your best promo speech slash teaser yeah so broken molds is uh telling the the story of how windsurfing came about and how it impacted the world and its people starting a revolution of water sports. I mean, one of the most classic scenes that I like to think about is this small group of friends being my grandfather, uh, Hobie Alter, uh, Grubby Clark and, and Tom Moray. And let's, you know, let's, you let's stop ima- here for a second. because Hobie Alter is the guy that invented the Hobie cat, right? Exactly. So, so all this this and small then, group and then of friends, Clark is Clark foam, which is yes. basically for like for a stretch of I don't know 30, 40, mm-hmm. 50 years, the only foam that surfboards and wind surfboards were ever shaped from. So But not only that, it gave it gave our sports the opportunity to go from wood to foam. And as soon as that happened, it revolutionized the sport. Right. And so you have pretty this small handy group, group of friends. <laughs> yeah. You have this small group of friends that were creative individuals that shared this passion for the ocean. Right. And I, I like to think of this scene, you know, like when I hear stories from my grandparents, like I like to think of this scene of all of them surfing Malibu and, and Tom Moore, being, who, by the way, invented the boogie board. Right. Tom Moore looking out thinking, Oh, it's pretty junk out there for surfing. But you know what? We could share our share surfing with our friends who are kooks and don't know how to surf with this thing. You know, what if we could just lay on this thing and anyone could do it? Booger and then it Hobie up. Alter and then Hobie Alter thinking, you know what? It's uh, you know, onshore, mushy. We got these cute girls with us on the beach. What if we could take them out on this, you know, mini catamaran style surfboard and all play around together out there? And then you got You know, my grandfather being like, yeah, but what if we could combine sailing and surfing and ride the waves on a sail surfboard, you know, like, and, and I, I just think of this excitement and this creativity because in this short period of time, this small group of individuals changed the world of water sports as we know it. And that's the story that we're telling in the, in the the film broken molds is how, of course, um, it's, it starts off with my grandfather's era and his generation and how they impacted and revolutionized the world of water sports. And then it moves on to my grandfather's generation with Robbie Nash and, and, uh, you know, all the other top riders, Laird Hamilton and, and all these amazing figures that were rock stars in windsurfing at the peak of its sport. And then it goes on to tell how they brought that skill and that knowledge to create new sports like kite surfing. Kite surfing came from windsurfers having fun on Maui. Toe surfing came from windsurfers having fun in Hawaii. You know, foot straps came from windsurfers, you know? And so all the board sports on the water that have foot straps, we could thank windsurfers for, you know, being able to get out there and toe surf big waves at Jaws. We could thank that original pioneer crew of windsurfers that explored up the coast and saw that wave and found that place and was like, you know what, we're going to ride that thing and we're going to windsurf it, you know? And so it's, uh, uh, that's kind of what excites me the most is, is being able to, to give a piece of history to everyone. And th- that's what it is, you know, so hell yeah, there's a ton of action for all the freaking coolest water sports in the world and the best riders doing that shit. But what's so cool about this film, and I've got to watch some rough drafts, you get drawn into these stories of these figures that you've heard names of your whole life. And you hear these, um, you know, the background 
what it was like, you know, the, the, it's, it's really, it's really cool. And it's a deep dive into, um, putting your shoes into what it was like to be in that generation at that time. Yeah. And I, and I think, I think it's really needed because, you know, as you say, you see on Instagram, so many of those short clips of guys doing amazing action and you see a double forward on a windsurfer or a freaking, um, whatever it's called, they do on this strapless kiting. That's so amazing. Like this spins with the board spins and whatever. And you kind of go like, ah, you know, but to tell a story, I don't think like, you know, the story cause you're from the family. I know a little bit of the story cause I'm a freaking nerd and, and study all this, you know, and then dig up and whatever. And I know people also. Um, but I think the majority of our generation doesn't know Jack about it. Yeah. Doesn't know. And, yeah. and even and I don't know Machek too. I want to share that with you. Like even for me as the grandson of the inventor, there's so much that I've learned from this film. Like we've been going through, like you got to understand my grandparents had a warehouse of magazines, news clippings, old film, uh, movie slides. We busted out their old school projector and, and like, we went through crazy old school clips. I learned so much about my family, about our sport, about the heroes that I've always looked up to and in, in all these water sports throughout this film. And I, I'm so excited to be able to share that. Yeah. I'm so excited to be able to share that with everyone else. Yeah. And about the tricky times too, right? Are we, are, are you going to dive into that whole uh, you know, windsurf, like, uh, the windsurfer wasn't the first kind of court totally. case and in the Whole UK. Timeline. That, yeah. yeah. So, and so it's that's not a I, sad movie, but there's definitely short shares, the turmoil and the struggle that my grandparents went through and their resilience to not give up because lawyers were doing everything in their power to make this fail and they didn't give up on it and they were persistent. They brought their family financially broke to make it happen until it succeeded, you know? And so it, it shows the struggles and the, and the, the amazing success story that, that our family went through. And, and all, it also kind of shares the um, firsthand experiences from people like Robbie Nash, Bjorn Dunkerbeck, you know, uh, Dave Klom, Laird Hamilton, the leaders, the ultimate legends and heroes of surfing, toe surfing, and windsurfing. And they are, are telling their story and their introduction to these sports. And they're telling stories like they're, my grandmother is their auntie, like their mom. You know yeah. what I mean? Like their yeah. second surf mama. You know, it's yeah. like, it's so funny. And so it's... Yeah. Uh, the, doing the research for, for this, I, I was pretty... Uh, pretty shocked how big this whole turmoil was, you know, and like, even to the point where, uh, where right now in this, um, in the UK, there's a precedent called the windsurfers precedent or whatever, something to do with patents. It's like, it, it's like incredible. But what what struck me the most is that, you know, even though the, your, 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 your grandparents actually kind of lost in the UK in court. Nobody yeah. like, you don't hear about the other, the other guys because their, their gear never really exploded as much, you know? So I think credit, credit to your, to your parents for make, to your grandparents making the sport that big, you know, it's like the other guys could have done it too. Right. I mean, if, if they, yeah. So it's and there's yeah. strategy, there was strategy. Like my grandmother, she really is the mother of this sport. I mean, like that she spent so much of her life planning, organizing, promoting, you know, being a, a caregiver for this sport, you know, and, and, and she really is why the sport was so successful. My grandfather might've been the, you know, he might have came up with the thought and had that original background and the passion of a surfer and a sailor to, to make put two and two together. And, and yes, spent his time, literally got kicked out of his college campus for building boards in the hallway. Like 
you know, he, but my grandmother, she made it what it is. She brought it to the world. She made that energy and that community. And it was a strategy for them to be able to have it grow in the direction that they wanted. Yeah. It's just like bringing up a kid. You know, if you're not there for your kid and you're not encouraging them along the way and guiding them on the right path, who knows what the shit they're going to get into. Right. And so I think that's what happened was as soon as my grandparents decided that these lawsuits are, are lit- literally taking away their soul and everything they worked for, they give, gave up in a way feeling defeated. Like, like what they, like their child's been ripped out of their arms. Yeah. You know? And so it's really, a, it's a sad story. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, as soon as that happened, you know, I would say many parts of it, it was the start of the end, you know, and now, now we see a, a reoccurrence a little bit, you know, which is really exciting because I think it's the first time we've ever seen some sort of a growth in our sport. And um, I, I want to say it's thanks to hydrofoiling, you know, and it's I'm a big sure, thanks. Yeah. To, it's a big thanks to hydrofoil. Um, yeah, I think it goes like, it goes in circles and, you know, like, you put a wing, there was this meme, a, a guy like speed winging and he had buttons and he had a harness on and it said like, ah, so you put buttons and you put a harness. Next thing you know, you're going to invent the windsurfer joint and reinvent windsurfing again. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so it's Yeah, like, just wait until there's a little pole that keeps the freaking thing in place, kind of. Like, yeah. well, what should we call that? Let's call it a mast. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's, <laughs> 50 years ago or whatever it was. 50 years ago it was. Hey, let's see if I can call my dad over here. I think I hear him. Ah, oh, sick. Hey, dad. Matt. Dad. No, nope, maybe not. <laughs> Hey, no, he I just thought I heard him over there. He, he just ignored <laughs> us, didn't he? <laughs> anyway, the nah, movie, but, you know, man, he, he, yeah. sends, he sends his aloha, though. He, he wanted me to say thank you for wanting to include him. You know, he appreciates it, and he sends his aloha to, to everyone watching, for sure. Um, you know, I, if, there's, if there's anything that I could share for him, I think it's, um, you know, it's, it's our excitement to share this film with the world. I, I think... You know, we're really excited to be able to share the story and the exciting uh, moments captured, you know, and it, some of this, some of the film that we're sharing is just historic. So old school, you know, um, it's, it's really cool. So, you know, to be able to see where it came from and where it's going. Can't wait. If you guys are interested, yeah. Can't Broken wait. Molds releasing summer 2021. Can't wait. It's going to be... It's going to be great. And, and tell me, how, how is it to make a movie, to make a film in 2021? I mean, surf movies, windsurf movies, uh, generally kind of, you know, feature length sports movies are kind of dead, right? I mean, this is maybe more of a documentary. So, but how, how challenging was it to get funding, to get distribution? How are you going to guys even, even release it? It fell like, in our laps. People are so passionate about this sport and people know the influence our family has had on it and they want to see the story be told. And so this film is made possible from a small group of passionate windsurfers that donated their own money to make this happen and encouraged my parents, my grandparents to be open to sharing. And so one of the, uh, the most influential individuals to, to make this, this happen is Scott Shoemaker. You might have heard of Scott Shoemaker. He's a professional windsurfer and a great friend of my dad and Mike Waltz from back in the day. He's one of the only people that I've heard of to get attacked by a shark while windsurfing and still survive. Um, and uh, that was at Hokeepa, by the way. Um, and he is one of the most passionate windsurfers I know. You know, he's out there windsurfing every day. He's still competing in the Grand Masters of the International Windsurf Tour. 
And um, he feels that windsurfing saved his life in many ways and still is continuing to save, you know, in, in many ways, give purpose to his life. And, you know, I remember when he approached us, you know, he was like, we have to tell the world. We have to tell the world. People don't know the, all the amazing things that, you know, we've been through, that your parents have been through, you know? And so this came about was just like really as a, a passion project, all from the right reasons, right? And so it's really great that we have full control over how we want to uh, share this, uh, you know? And so we have on rail productions, uh, poor boys productions and on and, and uh, Island eye productions directing this. And uh, if you guys know much about sports films, you know, poor boys productions and, and, and Island eye productions are pretty badass. They do some amazing films. And so we're, we're really grateful to be working with them. Uh, Jace Ponabianco and, uh, my brother, Maddie Schweitzer, and um, my, my dad's going to come over. That's sick, yeah. Hey, I can't hear you anymore. Hold on, what's that's, going on That's here? great. You can hear me? Yeah. I can hear myself in your speakers, so you got to be able to... There we go. I got you. I got you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that was my dad calling. He's going to come over and, and say hi. Um, but yeah, what, what were we just talking about? <laughs> The movie and how, you know, how Poor Boys is behind it, Jace, uh, yep. Johnny, your brother, Matty. Um, yeah, and it's it's so good, you know, to see a windsurfing movie. I mean, uh, so many times you'd be on trips with shitty internet uh, in Chile or whatever, and and you just, you know, you want to get psyched for for sailing, and you're not going to go on the Instagram or whatever, you know? You, you, throw, no. you throw a little, you know... Uh, Jason Pollock out about time or the windsurfing movie or the yeah. movie or the, the Nash or whatever, you know? So I really miss those times, like having, you know, DVDs and even VHSs. I even had VHSs. Oh, oh, okay. You know what? I'll make a custom request for you to make a VHS for you. Okay. We'll send <laughs> you a VHS. <laughs> I appreciate, <laughs> I appreciate that, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What do you what are you going to distribute it on? Just uh, i like iTunes and and online, or is there going to be like? There's a, a good chance it's going to be on Netflix. Um, we've been talking with Netflix, so that could so be really dope. cool. I know we're going to do some film fet, film premieres. Um, Daddy, oh, hey, quiet, quiet. How do you even? You want to sit right here on the table, Dad? Um, I can only stay for a second, but I'll say hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got somebody waiting for me to go fishing right now. Hi, how are you? Hey, thanks for thanks for joining us. We really appreciate you. This is the windsurfing podcast, and here we got the windsurfing legend, Matt Schweitzer, the first ever world champion. So can't get any better than that. We appreciate but you. like that. I'm the first ever podcast I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. A little cameo. <laughs> well, not I'm really. glad you jumped in, Dad, because we were talking a lot about just the wind broken molds, the film. Yeah. And maybe you could just share from your side about what people can expect for the film and, and your yeah. influence. And, and your it. feeling, your feeling. How do you how do you feel telling, you know, story of the story of your your family so so connected to it, you know? So how how's that from your perspective? Well, Pretty much the Broken Molds film is, uh, you know, I have a personal relationship because of my dad invented the windsurfer, but a lot of these sailors went on to do things because of windsurfing. Like all the sailors, you know, kite surfing is pretty much because of windsurfing and toe surfing because the foot straps, all of a sudden the guys are all, wow, we could put foot straps on the board and toe. And then, I mean, everything that it has happened all the way to winging, believe it or not. We used to foil years ago. Man, I was like 1979. We had foiled before on a windsurfer, but they were crappy. And now they're, you know, unreal. But <laughs> that, that's kind of the new, new hype right now is foiling. You know, all types of foil, winging and windsurfing and kite foiling. You go, I went to California about, you know, not that long ago, and it was all kiters with foils. I'm like, wow. You know, everything's really changed, but 
that's kind of what the film's about is the progression of where windsurfing went with these different people changing it with different aspects. And yeah, it's really, uh, definitely feel like I have a connection to everything because most everyone that started these sports were windsurfers in the beginning. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it definitely sounds, sounds like you're right in the, right in the middle of it, right? Like you're, you know, your parents, invented it and grew it and kind of made it popular. And now, you know, your kids are doing our, you know, all around Waterman. And, you know, as you say, a lot of the stuff has been, yeah, has been invented by, uh, by it's, it's incredible. Like, uh, yeah, like we've been discussing for an hour now, you know, it's, uh, it's crazy. Um, so we hear, so we hear you, uh, you sub fishing and windsurf fishing these days a lot. <laughs> How's that I'm going? I'm about to go right now. Yeah, I just <laughs> I just set up my sub board with a, a bottom fish thing and I rigged up some baits. But yeah, it's fun fun to do. It's the first beautiful day we've had in a long time. Do you get planing behind the mai mai or something? <laughs> well, well, with the, with the windsurfer, it's really easy. You just stand there and hold the sail, and you know, supping. You have to go way out there, but. I'm just, it's so calm today. There's no wind. So just a different, different way of doing it. Perfect. And plus I like to scoot around with things like this all the time. If it's something different, I haven't fished off my sup board yet. This is my first time doing it. I just rigged it up. So I'm, you know, so you got a little, you got a little dad, dad inventor type thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I feel, I feel my dad's like my biggest hero, you know, in many ways I I'm encouraged to be creative and, and to live life to the fullest because of him. I mean, he had a lot of opportunities in Windsor, but at the same time, had a lot of fun doing other things, you know, and dirt bike. My dad's an amazing dirt biker and fisherman. And I'm sure he doesn't want to hear, hear us talk about what he's good at, but yeah, but I did. Start, <laughs> but you said in the beginning about how I kind of like started things. And you know, during windsurfing, I was the first guy to put a, a sail on a skateboard. And I used to rip around the parking lots like that. And then it kind of became popular. Then the kind of fun, I was making my boards, match whites or proto designs, sold them in Europe and Japan all over. And it was going great. And then myself and a guy named Bob Oli, we were shaping a board. And I just said, hey, I want one for the bottom turn, narrower pintail, and a wider tail on the other side for off the lip for the uh, for the starboard tack. Oh, no, asymmetrical. Yeah, first it, ever. So I made the first asymmetrical. A lot of po people thought it was like Craig Masonville, but I, I was the surfer has actually that. got inspired from that original shape to implement yeah. that on surfboards. But it, but it's been really fun. My point is is how everything, you know, we thought we were on top of the world by putting foot straps on a 12 foot windsurfer and getting air. And it, at the time, it was like, oh my god, we're <laughs> we're flying like 20 feet. You know, like it can't get any better. And then all of a sudden, as <laughs> You know, now guys are doing triple flips and shit. It's just insane. But yeah, so I, just I, 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 read, I read an interview with you and you said like that was the best, your best windsurfing experience. Maybe it was an old interview when you got straps in Mexico and you just yeah, you no, exactly your jumps. Yeah, I'll never forget it. I've been, already been windsurfing for you know ten years, and uh, all of a sudden, I just put these straps. I brought this board with me, the first one with foot strap, put them on. It's blowing like 30 miles an hour. And right away, I'm just like, it was completely like I was in a, the best dream of my life. <laughs> this is insane. And so it's been really fun to watch the progression of, um, yeah. of windsurfing with yeah. all the equipment and everything. Zane, Zane yeah. here tells us that you, as opposed to him, you're not really the rock star type Bring us back to, you know, to the seventies when you would rock up in Europe, the mystic, the mystical guys from, from the U S and from Hawaii. I was, I was sharing, we were comparing like the image of like you as opposed to maybe Robbie. And to me, I kind of get the vibe that you've always wanted to be outside yeah. of the camera. You don't want, you don't like to be kind of in the front yeah. where, you know, I, and so it's so all, I see you as a hero that chose to be, take a humble path. Yeah, and I think that's what he's trying to. I, yeah, like, I was I was one of the first guys towing it at Jaws with Victor Lopez and some of the boys, and we never had people on the cliff taking pictures. We didn't even call anybody. We had many days windsurfing too. You and nowadays everything is recorded. I mean, yeah. people are filming their food. People are filming. 
<laughs> he gives me so much shit. He gives me so much shit every time I'm like trying to plan a little content creation. Uh, you know, it's like, and he's like, well, just go out there, have some fun. You don't need a freaking filmer, photographer. What do you mean? Well, there is something to be said about, about doing things that sticks in your memory like that. I mean, I understand filming. It's unreal. People get to see it and stuff. I guess I'm, I'm selfish in a way with uh, just trying to do things fun myself all the time and not film it. I, I go riding all the time by myself and everyone's all, God, are you kind of lonely up there? I'm all, no, man, I'm going as fast as I can. <laughs> Freaking get back to the car going, yes, I didn't yeah. break any bones. Yeah. Yeah. All good. It is. It is. It feels pure. You know, nowadays it feels like work. You need to post everything and film everything. Yeah. You know, and, you know like people want to see what you do. Like, you know, you got in the contest, like what you eat for breakfast when you compete, you know? So, so yeah, it is, <laughs> there is a little bit of that, but for sure, when you did, when you did windsurfer events, I don't know, in Lago, you fly into Lago di Garda, you know, and there's oh, a thousand, a thousand competitors yeah. and you're, you're I've been the there. Guy. You can run across the boards. You can run across the boards out there. <laughs> yeah. So there is that Hollywood Hollywood thing. Yeah. I mean, I think we ain't we ain't shit compared to what you what you've been through in terms of you know the the cameras and the glamour and all that. But you know what it is? You know? It's also that you guys now. I'm 61. Okay, I was born in 1960. When I was a teenager, we didn't have cell phones. Our cameras were shitty. The um, so everything's different now. You know that's the thing. Like I have a hard time on the computer. I have to ask my granddaughter to help me you know it's it's insane <laughs> I, yeah I, I, it's a different generation and and it's true you guys are nothing to be ashamed of man amazing all the uh, people now could just jump into the best equipment ever on a windsurfer or a kite or or whatever their you know sport is you know when i was younger man the equipment wasn't we thought it was great but yeah wow yeah. <laughs> one, one, one last one, one last one. And <laughs> we yeah. don't hold you too much. Bring us back to how it was out there on the water competing. Zane was telling us you guys would throw freestyle moves and rail rides and whatever just before the start and that it was a really fun above all type experience. Oh yeah. But yeah, I mean, the, the start, the start lines were so, we had so many people at nationals and worlds, hundreds of people. And, and, it, and yeah, I'm serious about my triangle racing, getting up wind and reading the wind shifts and, you know, little stupid things. I remember like pulling off port stack, port tack starts with a hundred people coming at you and just knowing I got the lift and you, you make it pat. You're like, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot, you know, reading the wind. And that's why I really love triangle racing was, you know, reading all the wind shifts and it was a very mental game. Yeah. And, um, and no harnesses. Yeah. So it wasn't only mental, must have been pretty fun. physical. <laughs> yeah. With yeah. No, 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 the harness, man, when that harness came out, that was, that was easy, yeah. but, I don't know. Some reason, we, back in the day, we we could hang. Men were more men, I guess. Day. Yeah, our yeah. hands were just gnarly. No, I think what he was asking though was oh, yeah, like, talk about the freestyle. Yes. Yeah. So starts. anyway, at the start of the, the you know hundreds of races that I've done, all of a sudden we'd start screwing around, and that's how freestyle started, and it became the um, what the top guys wanted to win more than anything, and it was fun, and it was really hard. I mean, an eight or 12 minute routine, depending on which it was, you are jamming the whole time. You're breathing, your heart rate is pumping. And if you could pull off a, you know, upside down rail ride, which we call an ever roll taken after Gary Eversall, the original badass from Florida, great freestylist. And then some other people from Mexico, Raul de, Raul de Zib and uh, Nilo. Anyway, there, there was people from different countries in France that all had their, maneuvers that were different than what other people had. And then we started learning from other people and throwing everything together for that routine. And man, that, that freestyle became pretty serious. Nobody really said it, but when you're watching your competitor, you're like, Oh, come on, fall, you know, <laughs> because it was really competitive. Man. Yeah. 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 I couldn't, I couldn't believe Zane was telling me, ah, yeah, it was all family and fun. I'm like, 
hell no, these guys were competing for real, you know? Like my oh, dad, sure. my dad got stabbed <laughs> with a fork from an angry <laughs> French competitor. No, don't one say time. that. Don't just from a competitor. Either. An angry competitor. <laughs> don't, take that out, don't worry, you know? don't worry. Nothing <laughs> changed in terms of the French. The French or anybody at all. It just happened to be this guy. It was, was competitive. Really, no. This guy was definitely drunk at a at a trophy <laughs> presentation, and I got stabbed because I won the overall world championship. He was so pissed. <laughs> Really? Come on. That's that's I no, never got I never got to the point where I'd stab anybody with a fork. <laughs> <laughs> that's when you know you made it. Uh, people yeah. are, are so jealous they stab you with a fork. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I want to tell a little story for my dad. So I'm I met my chef in Ancon, Peru. Must have been 2006, I want to say. 2008. Um, uh, you know what it was? It was uh, New Year's Eve. It, yeah, we had the event through throughout New Year's Eve. What an idea, by the way! Uh, oh, it was two, insane. We were partying so hard. We were like seven, eight teenagers partying together in Peru. So, it was so fun. Fell off the cliff? That was a different trip. Yeah, that was. A- <laughs> are you are you in Peru right now? No, no, I'm in Tenerife, uh, Canary Islands. I'm in Canary Islands. God, it looks it looks like a place in Hana. That island in the background behind you, I'm like, wow. It might be. It's just a backdrop. It's this te- fake technology. It's not real. It's not I have, real. A, I have oh, a white. Oh, it's not a real backdrop. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's Hana. No way. Okay, okay. I have a, I have a white wall behind me. Don't worry. <laughs> that's funny. Right on. Well, thank you so much for having us, Mashek. Yeah, nice, nice to uh, meet you. And uh, dang. We appreciate you guys. Lucky, really, really appreciate lucky. Whatever you what did. What a lucky time in life, though, for all these bitching sports. And if the wind's dead, you can go do something else. And there's, if you don't have, you can't find anything to do, then there's something wrong with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, so I appreciate you guys. I yeah. I do. I do. <laughs> you, you pictured him. He, he pictured, uh, he pictured you as this really, you know, kind of, um, calm, very, very, you know, very kind of down, like how you say, not down to earth, but like almost distanced uh, person, and not to you know. And I see there's there's a lot of there's a lot of Zane in you, so or there's oh, a yeah, lot yeah. Of in Zane. I, I can talk. I feel okay talking to you, but I don't like being pressured doing it. Like sometimes people will come over. And, yeah, this is cool. You're not stressing me out at all. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole point of it. That's the whole point of it. Uh, yeah. Well, hey, nice to meet you, man. We appreciate you. We appreciate you for everything you did for our for our sport. I mean, the fact that I can have a career in windsurfing and whatever is down to a lot of you guys. So, um, so really, well, I would tell you to get out there and show me some moves, but you might break the screen with the masks. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's nine p.m. as well. It's eight thirty p.m. So tomorrow, right. <laughs> tomorrow. I appreciate you, pleasure, guys. brother. Nice to meet you. Thank you. A lot. Thank you for Hopefully, coming get on. on the water with you soon. Yes. Okay. See you guys. See ya. And there you go. What a superb podcast. Uh, give us a thumbs up if you like that. Let us know in the comments what you thought about it. Some super interesting stuff there. Uh, if you do like these podcasts, don't forget to subscribe. They're coming out every Wednesday. Uh, Machet Rakowski doing a great job. And if you want to chip in some beer money, help these things keep flowing, you can join that. We have been giving away some pretty decent prizes recently. If you are a member, we've given away sales. We've got another uh, sale giveaway coming up. The Simmer Sale giveaway. Uh, so, yeah, stay tuned to the channel and thanks once again for tuning in.